Hello and welcome. My name is Corey Thomas Hutchison, and I am an independent folklorist and researcher with a doctorate in American Studies from Penn State University. My specialty areas of study are folklore and ethnography, especially areas of performance, festivity, and folk belief, and I also have a subspecialization in ethnicity and religion. I'm going to be talking today about what I'm calling wicked games, or playing fair with fear, dangerous, and forbidden games. This talk was originally given as part of the Pop Culture Association, American Culture Association annual meeting in 2022. A group of young women crack an egg into a glass of warm water, watching as the white swirls and congeals, looking for a hint of a future husband. Preteens at a suburban sleepover turn out the lights and light scented candles as one pulls a Ouija board from a backpack with a sly grin. A young man gets a message from a friend on his Snapchat, pointing him towards a series of puzzles on strange websites, ultimately leading to a final link. He's not quite sure he wants to click, fearful of what's on the other side. Whether in the form of simple fortune-telling games involving flower petals and pop can tabs, to more elaborate rituals involving breath control or hypnosis and levitation, most people are familiar with the forms of occult and forbidden play, even if they have not thought about it critically. The use of games and performance to experience altered states of consciousness, enter the unknown, or experiment with the limits of physical reality can be used to test the limits of spiritual experience as well, or as a form of generational rebellion against social boundaries. With the runaway popularity of shows like The Circle and Squid Game, the interest in dangerous games has grown intensely in recent years. Because many people have participated in occult play or encountered it through popular culture and media at some point in their lives, they recognize the games even as they regard them with hesitation or fear. In part, this is a fundamental element of occult games, fear representing the boundaries of comfort versus the unknown, which are tested by this kind of play. However, the ubiquity of these games and their play suggests that they are popular, functional tools for social conditioning, ones that many in American culture share across generational, gender, social, ethnic, and economic backgrounds. In the next few minutes, I will look at the historical continuity for these games, discuss their functions and interpretations while drawing upon key scholars and studies, and look at the way these games exist at an intersection of several areas of folk and popular culture. Further, I will also look at contemporary manifestations of occult play evolving into digital spaces and suggest that these wicked games are gaining new dimensions of performativity through streaming social sites like YouTube or TikTok. Let's start by defining wicked games and occult play. At a basic level, we're examining quote-unquote play done by people of many ages, but primarily occurring at the time of adolescence to young adulthood, so roughly from entering the double digits to the mid-twenties. Play involves adaptive variability, according to game scholars Brian Sutton-Smith, who points out that what links a chessboard to a game of tag is a combination of a few fixed, recognizable elements with a wide variety of potential choices or actions that change the nature of play in the moment. Occult play, then, is play that involves engagement with secret or hidden parts of a person's worldview. In fancy academic language, it's a form of ritual ostension. It is both deeply tied into performance and belief. Folklorist Elizabeth Tucker says that these games, that they are marked, quote, by the presence of certain symbolic elements over a wide span of time and space, and that they create a sense of ritualistic potency. As in many rituals, the order of events must be faithfully maintained, the tone must be solemn, and the outcome is expected to be something almost miraculous. Many components of Tucker's definition fit a wide range of games played by people experimenting with the otherworldly, occult, or supernatural. However, it is worth noting that, like most folklore, one definition rarely manages to capture every instance of the folk text. In the case of games, rules about games, quote, faithfully maintained, give way to new variations on all playforms as the resources and technologies change, and, quote, solemn tones can be better understood as serious play, 
where a solemn mood may be broken by a sudden change in the game. Beyond all definitions, we have the games themselves, which take on a number of forms. Some of the broad categories of occult play include fortune telling, spirit summonings, sensory or body play, legend trips, or ritual costuming and guising. For the purposes of concision, I'm going to limit myself to including only a few examples here, primarily from the fortune telling or spirit summoning games, which are the most common, although I will also mention legend trips and other forms of occult play as well. Many of these categories are permeable with some fortune-telling games involving summoning spirits, for example. I will also like to note that most of my geographical focus will be on North America as well, since that's my primary zone of study. Fortune-telling games have a long history and seem to be a fairly typical form of occult play for older children and for young adults. For example, one account from Salem leading up to the infamous witch trials describes the use of a, quote, Venus glass, which involved dropping egg whites into a goblet of water to divine the future identity of a husband. Although it should be noted that this account was called, uh, was a memorit recalled several decades after the trial, so the reliability may be questionable in regards to the trials themselves. Many other games, such as filling a boiled egg with salt to dream of a future husband who would offer the dreamer water, appear in folk collections from the 17th to the 20th centuries. Other common games grew out of the booming spiritualist movement of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The best known are the use of talking boards, such as the Ouija board and seances. Religious scholar Catherine Albanese and folklore scholar Bill Ellis have both done excellent work tracing the roots of these practices to the serious religious frameworks of spiritualism, while also showing how they turned into less formal games among adolescents and young adults. Ellis in particular notes that the sinister connotations of Ouija boards largely only appeared as a result of religious debates among various American Christian denominations in the mid-20th century, and prior to that they were not seen as demonic or particularly threatening. Much of that perception derived after the publication and release of books and films like The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby. Many fortune-telling games are treated with much less fear and suspicion than Ouija boards, despite being much more widely played by contemporary youth. For example, paper fortune tellers, sometimes called cootie catchers, are a common classroom or playground craft. Similarly, the game MASH, an acronym that can stand for variations of Mansion Alley Shack House or Mansion Apartment Shack Home, is a simple pencil and paper game used to predict future occupations, family partnerships, and housing conditions. These games are seldom treated with the same level of seriousness or supernatural inflection that a seance would be, but they do represent a common fortune-telling method. These methods also evolve over time. A prime example would be the alphabet divination method involving flexing or twisting a part of an object until it breaks. The break would coincide with a letter that was thought to be the initial of a particular love interest. In the early to mid 20th century, folklorists like Iona Opie and Simon Bronner recorded children playing this game, twisting an apple stem, naming a different letter for each twist, A, B, C, and so forth. By the late 20th century, apples with stems were less common in school lunches, but soda machines had been installed in many schools. So, accordingly, the tab top of a soda can replaced the apple stem, flexed back and forth until it broke while naming the letters. Similarly, spirit summonings make up a significant portion of occult game lore. Probably one of the best known versions of spirit summoning is the game Bloody Mary, in which someone will repeat a particular chant or phrase before a mirror in a dark room until a phantom of a woman appears in the mirror. Crucially, there are a number of narratives surrounding the game. Mary is a woman searching for her baby, La Llorona style in some cases, or in some cases she's a vengeful witch. Summoning her can mean a one-time encounter in which she leaves scratch marks on the summoner, or a longer-term haunting, depending on the version played. These spirits' summonings do often involve elaborate rules and rituals, many of which are parallel to rules found for summoning spirits in medieval grimoires. Compare, for example, the creation of a magic circle found in the Clavicula Solomonis, or Key of Solomon, a medieval grimoire here in translation by S. L. McGregor Matthews. The master should reassemble his disciples, encourage them, reassure them, fortify them, and conduct them to the parts of the circle of art, where he must place them in the four quarters of the earth. And he should have in his hand the consecrated taper of wax, and he should light it and place it in a hidden or secret place prepared for it. Let him after this re-enter and close the circle. Compare that summoning to the more contemporary summoning known as the Three Kings Ritual, a contemporary internet-based ritual that appeared around 2011 or 2012 in forums like Reddit's No Sleep, Creepypasta slash Something Awful, and similar sites. 
When your alarm clock goes off at 3.30 a.m., get out of bed, light the candle, and grab your phone. You have three minutes to return to your prepared room. When you enter the room, close the door behind you. Your chosen partner in this ritual should wait right outside the room and be as quiet as possible. Protecting your candle flame, take your place on the throne. Your body should block the wind from the fan behind you and keep it from burning out the candle. In many cases, these spirit summonings come with dire warnings about the consequences if they're done improperly. Similar games appear in places like Japan, where Daruma-san involves being pursued by the spirit of a drowned woman unless the player can manage to evade her or look her directly in the eyes before she catches them. Many will recognize these games as major influences on popular culture, or possibly influenced by popular culture, through films such as Candyman or The Ring. So what is the point of playing all these occult games then? Why engage with the supernatural using play at all? In the case of many of these wicked games, the answer is multifaceted. For some games, there's a superficial aim or reward. An answer about a future spouse or a job, the ability to ask a spirit a question or request a favor. In many of these games, additional levels of meaning appear too. For example, Bill Ellis has convincingly pointed out that while religious infighting scapegoated Ouija boards into a demonic device, a significant number of people who reported using them were from evangelical Christian backgrounds. In those cases, participants played the games only once or a few times, often during a period when they were questioning their faith. The games served to reaffirm their faith in their beliefs or lead them in new directions with those beliefs. If demons exist, they reason, so must angels, God, and other religious entities. Playing occult games becomes a test of faith and goes hand in hand with their reaffirmed beliefs. Engaging in games like Bloody Mary, Cat Scratch, or Concentrate also tests the boundaries of the quote, real world, and expand one's worldview to accommodate the possibilities of the unknown. Expecting an encounter and experiencing anything out of the ordinary offers the opportunity to reevaluate the rules that have governed the known universe. Playing with the supernatural is playing with one's very framework for reality, and the world can become much bigger, either by affirming that something has happened, or that nothing did, depending on the person. Additionally, there's a social component for much of the world of occult play. Many people play occult games during social events, most famously the sleepover in youth or adolescence, although frequently these occur in less structured settings and happen spontaneously as well. An enormous part of any supernatural play involves the discussions that happen after the encounter, as individuals replay their experiences and share their impressions, interpretations, and analysis of their participation in the game. People will tell these stories years later, especially when comparing notes on their versions of occult play to the encounters had by others. Folklore scholar Patricia Mealy has noted that the social bonding component of games like Legend Trips, where groups of people will visit a reportedly haunted or cursed site together, are in fact the primary reason for participating. Whether or not anyone sees a ghost or hears a spooky noise, they are all in the car together at the end, frequently pumped full of adrenaline and eager to discuss what had happened. There's a performative edge that involves meeting or contrasting experiences and expectations from those in the friend group using the game as a tool to do so. But what about a contemporary occult game? After all, even in a pre-COVID era, many young people were engaging with one another in online spaces at least as much as they were doing so in person. This led some scholars like Linda Daig to complain that folk traditions like sleepover games were dying, saying, quote, couch potato passivity has replaced the vibrant creativity of the slumber party. Brian Sutton Smith and Felicia McMahon also noted at the end of the 20th century that, quote, much of children's folklore has taken on the velocity of the fads and fashions of the modern entertainment world. In the spectator culture that goes with the modern industrial society, the children's imitations of these fads indicates that their folklore is also shifting rather than disappearing. We would also expect much of children's folklore to now be increasingly more verbal or symbolic rather than physical. Are occult play instances disappearing, though? Scholar Annalise Ferris revises some of the criticisms leveled by Daig and expands upon the thoughts of Sutton Smith and McMahon, saying, quote, It is not that children in the past were more imaginative or social, but rather that children today interact with one another and transmit their folklore in different ways, often through technological media. The need to experiment with the unknown and the supernatural has been with us for a long time, after all, and young people often still feel a need to engage with this play. Increasingly, contemporary digital tools are offering numerous ways to do just that. 
In my own research, I have spent many hours surveying and interviewing people about their experiences with supernatural games. In one informal survey of participants ranging from ages 18 to 75, with around 50 people initially responding, for example, I found many people who had still grown up playing the, quote, classic sleepover games such as Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board, or Concentrate, as well as lighter versions of games such as Fortune Tellers or MASH, or even using Magic 8 Balls. Most reported playing these games between the ages of 12 to 16, with significant numbers still ranging into the tween years or even up into the 20s and beyond. Nearly two-thirds reported that they had changed religious affiliations in adulthood, however, indicating that the games had not necessarily led them to become more entrenched in their spiritual worldview. Instead, several reported that the social functions became more central, and that the worldviews being tested involved their own bodies and identities. For example, many mentioned that these games involved being in dark spaces, holding hands or sitting very close to others, or touching them for games like Light as a Feather. One informant even made the comment, quote, these games helped to provide a safe slash liminal space where I was able to explore my sexuality. Being scared gives you an excuse to be more physically close to folks, and as a closeted gay kid at the time, it gave me and other curious closeted kids to sit more closely together or even share a bed. Beyond the traditional games, however, many informants had not heard of most of the more contemporary digital ones found online in forums like Reddit's No Sleep or Creepypasta. Some had heard of games like Charlie Charlie, or even seen a paranormal social media challenge involving summoning or confronting ghosts, but games like Daruma-san, Sara Sarita, and others were unknown. That does not mean, however, that no one is playing them. In fact, one of the primary places where they're played is in front of a camera. Those engaging with paranormal play in the 21st century often do so as part of their social media experience. In some cases, they use social media to recount their engagement with the supernatural. One of the best known examples of this is the Dear David Twitter thread, started by cartoonist Adam Ellis about his run-ins with a child ghost portending all sorts of doom and gloom. The ghost had a caved-in forehead, and Ellis, known for his satire and humor, often walked a razor-thin line between belief and skepticism when recounting his tale. His story is captivating, and is even scheduled to be a film in the near future, but perhaps the most enthralling is the response that he received. Twitter, after all, is a social media platform, and the comments responding to his tweets were explosive. Many felt the need to share their own encounters or warn Ellis what to do next to avoid any David-related calamities. Similarly, in a YouTube video about playing the Sarah Sarita game, a spirit summoning ritual involving the spirit of a murdered girl answering questions based on coin flips, two young women performed the ritual by asking identity-oriented questions such as, Sarah Sarita, are you a girl? Do you know if you're a boy or a girl? Do you know if you're transgender? Are you over 30? And do you want us for company? The video is on a channel with less than 3,000 subscribers, but the video had over 25,000 views and 125 comments. Many commenters criticized the girls for things like their pronunciation of the game, saying Sarah Sarita, or their inclusion of the question about transgender status. Others offered their own experiences in contrast, or warned the young women about the consequences of playing. One commenter said, also make sure to only ask something three times or she will get mad. Another responded, when I started playing this video, out of nowhere a coin dropped and that scared me. In dozens of other similar videos, people playing these games on platforms like YouTube, Instagram Reels or Live, and TikTok, equivalent situations play out. Encounters are documented, but the turn towards the camera invites the viewer to become a participant. Viewers are asked to like and comment, and frequently do, providing their own narratives as a way of expanding on the boundary testing these games are doing. Questions about gender identity, political ideology, spiritual belief, and mental health are prominent, with commenters adding their own experiences and warnings regarding the games and the potential meanings of those games. Geographical boundaries are also expanded through participation and sharing of these games, even if the boundary breaking is performative. Many of the narratives associated with occult games uh, and play will begin by situating a game in terms of its origins. Notably, the Three Kings game and Sweet Tooth the Gnome, a game involving a mere traveling candy-eating gnome, are cited as Russian in origin, while stories about Daruma-san are situated as Japanese. Japan's J-horror upsurge in the 1990s and early 2000s spawned a spate of games shared online, including Hitori Kakurenbo, or Hide and Seek by Yourself, in which you are pursued by a cursed doll through your home. Some of these games have folk origins documented in extant folklore collections, and some seem to be new improvisations based on shifting Japanese cultural trends. 
As viewers of these games mediated through a screen, we become, in a sense, the observed and conjured spirits, disembodied and watching, leaving our messages from beyond the keyboard in a comment section. We are ghosts in the machine, so to speak, invited guests in a like-subscribe seance. While I am still compiling research information on this phenomenon, the realm of games continues to expand. As noted earlier, cult play has not died out in the slightest, but has taken on a new kind of performative role in which those who engage with the games are not performing solely for their friends involved with the games directly, but potentially for hundreds or thousands of ghost friends in the comments section, the Twitter feed, or the stitched video response. These forbidden rites and wicked games continue unabated, and the inventiveness of new generations playing games like Midnight Man or Baby Blue Blue Baby on a live stream as they navigate the supernatural is both spectacle and socialization. What new games will appear in the coming years, and how will they tell us about the boundaries of our realities and our bonds with each other? Thank you.